Welcome to the Highway Church of Christ in Benton, Arkansas. that's repeated in there. 
He says, I see your works and your charity or your love, your service that you're doing towards your fellow man, the faith that you have, your patience and your long serving. And again, he says, your works. He's knowing that you are a congregation who started out being faithful in your service and working, and it has not stopped. I tired wasn't a group of people that said, Lord, we've been working long enough. We're going to just hang it up right now. They weren't like the church in Ephesus. who had forgotten their first love. This was a church, Jesus said to them, the last to be more than the first. They were continuing to abound, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. They were abounding in good works. There were so many good things that this church was doing that Jesus said they works twice. Friends, the things that they were doing most recently in this letter was written, they were greater than the way they started out. They had not waned in their service to the Lord. They had increased. They had found more things to do. They had found more ways to serve the Lord. More ways to help their fellow man. Maybe more ways to look after the poor. More ways to share the word of God. Whatever it was that they were doing, they were doing more and more and more. And Jesus, he lets them know, I see what you're doing. I see that you are a busy congregation. There is no such thing as a bench warming Christian. There's no such thing as sitting down and resting here on time side of life from our labor. The Bible says that when this life is over, then we shall find a rest from our labor. Not now. For any age group, for any physical limitations there is work for us to do, for any amount of knowledge or wisdom that we have or, or biblical understanding there is work for us to do. No person, no Christian should ever say, well, there's nothing for me to do here. I dare say you're not looking hard enough. Jesus said this congregation was not like that. This was not a congregation where people were letting the grass grow under their feet. This was a congregation of people that were working. And though there were things wrong there, he wanted to start off to let them know, I see your work. You are a laboring and a serving congregation. This is what discipleship should look like. A group of people who are busy in their communities, busy in their homes, busy within the congregation, doing everything that we can do to enhance the Lord's church and to enhance the community around about us. This was a serving congregation. But after their commendation, Jesus had to rebuke them. As much as they were working, as much as they were loving, as much as they were exercising service to their fellow man, they were practicing their faith, they were patient, they put up with one another, they were not ill-tempered, it doesn't seem. They were not short-sighted with people, they continued to endure and to be long-suffering just like God is toward us. He says, but there was something that he had against them, notwithstanding have a few things against thee. What, Jesus, could you have against the church? We look at the way that these, these churches receive their commendation and rebuke. Most often, just like in Pergamos, it is the case that the sin and the issues starts in the pews. Some of the congregations did a good job at keeping that which was bad out, but the sin would start on the inside, usually with false teaching. That was no different here in Thyatira. What were they doing? He says, because thou sufferest, or you tolerate, or you put up with that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. This was terrible. Now, as we start, Jesus says, you suffer that woman Jezebel. Usually, when we want to let someone know they're doing something very good or very bad, we go to the greatest degree and name something or someone that is so great in that category where you know this is the epitome. And Jesus wants them to know you are putting up with someone that is the epitome of unrighteousness and wickedness. <coughs> you know, if you're going to name an athlete, it's the greatest athlete. You don't name the person that sits on the bench. If you want to name a singer or compare someone to a singer, you would name someone who is famed and, and world-renowned. You wouldn't name the guy down the street from you who happens to have a guitar and can sing. 
You want to name someone at any moment? No. And Jesus to remind them of just how wicked this person was and how terrible they were for tolerating it. He went all the way back in history that we can read about, starting in 1 Kings 16, that ends with her death in 2 Kings chapter 9. He says that woman Jezebel, if you are not familiar with her, Jezebel was a princess from the kingdom of Sidon. She was a wicked, a devious, deceitful, power-hungry, unrighteous woman. There are adjectives that we can add from here to the moon to describe her, but she was wicked to say the least. Her marriage to one of the children of Israel, Ahab, was to shore up an alliance between two kingdoms, to make sure that trade could continue, to make sure that protection could be offered. It was a political marriage, but she took full advantage of this marriage, and she really ran the show. Now, Ahab was no, uh, was no cowardly man. He was mighty in his warlike exploits, but he was not strong enough to stand up against his wife, or at least she was stronger than he was. She was unrighteous, she was shrewd, she was evil, she was wicked, and she caused him to sin, to worship idols. And it seems that this person with whom this church is dealing might have something to do with the trade group. Maybe this person had influence among those trading guilds, and maybe it was the case that they offered her or allowed her to take this position or seize this position of leadership in order to maintain their trade <coughs> We don't know all the details, but whatever the case, this church at Thyatira allowed this person, who Jesus compares to one of the most evil and wicked women in the entire world, says, you're, you're tolerating her. Look what he says about her. He says that she calls herself a prophetess. She is a self-ordained or self-appointed prophetess. When we read about what it means to be a prophet, when we look in the Old Testament and even the New, every time God calls a prophet, the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to this person. The word of the Lord came to that person. God put his word in the mind and the mouth and the heart of an individual. But Jezebel was not ordained by God. She had her own message. She had her own God. She had her own purpose. She's a wicked lady. She was not motivated by righteousness but by greed, power. And this congregation was allowing this person that Jesus refers to as Jezebel, they were allowing her to do multiple things that corrupted this church. What did they allow this person to do? The first thing he says, you're allowing this person, Jezebel, a self-appointed prophet, first to teach. She had no authority to be teaching in the church in the position that she was. It seems that she was trying to appoint herself as a public teacher or a preacher, maybe, as it were. What else was she doing? In addition to trying to teach unrighteousness, she was trying to seduce. That is, to cause one, that word seduce means to cause one to roam from the truth or from virtue or from safety, to seduce. To, to, to try to appeal to your most carnal senses to say, oh, don't you want to take some of this? So that you'll take smaller steps away from righteousness and truth. She's trying to just lure you in. She wouldn't come right and say, hey, come on wholesale and sin with me. No, she would just subtly seduce, appeal to one's carnal senses, and try to get people away from the Lord. They allowed this person to teach. They knew what she was teaching. They knew her heart, and they tolerated her. Not only did they let her teach, but they allowed her to seduce people. If you know that a person is teaching and seducing or drawing people away from virtue and truth and safety from inside of Christ, my friends, we ought not to tolerate that. This congregation, they were wrong. Why were they wrong? Listen to what Jesus says. You suffered. You tolerated. You put up with this wicked person, which means the opposite. If we want to do that, which is right, what should we do? Not tolerate, not put up with, and not allow someone to seduce 
us into unrighteousness. This congregation was wrong. Just like we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 earlier today. That congregation, they thought they were so holy. Look at us. We're so holy. We even put up with a man living openly in sin. And they bragged about that. Paul said, your glory is wrong. Purge out the old leaven. Get rid of the sin. This congregation, they were putting up with this person who was teaching and seducing <laughs> God's people to do what? Commit fornication. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 tells us to flee fornication. And yet this person is trying to draw Christians to fornication. To do what else? To eat things Sacrifice unto idols. Now Paul went through lengths to talk about that which was sacrificed to idols. Idols are nothing, he said. Idols are nothing. And if there's meat sacrificed to idols, it, it means nothing. But my friends, you should avoid it if it leads to unrighteousness. If it causes someone to stumble or sin in their faith, avoid it. Paul says, I won't eat meat at all, ever. If that's what it takes. She was drawing people not to just say, oh, meat is nothing. She was drawing people toward actual, literal idolatry. And it seemed that this person was teaching people to do the same thing, committing fornication. Taint your bodies. Taint yourselves. Enjoy life. Friends, if it offends our Lord, if it goes against what God says, it's not enjoyment. It, it's devilish entertainment. It does not bring true joy. It might bring what some think to be or would call momentary pleasures, but it has a lifetime, or it has an eternity, rather, of consequences. And this congregation was putting up with it. They suffered this person, Jezebel. But our Lord wanted them to know of his patience. They were allowing this person to continue to do what they were doing. But look at what the Lord says. I gave her space to repent of her fornication. Now when he says space, this is not, this is not distance. God is not saying, or Jesus really is not saying, I step back from her and let her do what she wanted to do with space to repent. This word space here, he's saying, I'm allowing her time to repent. In the same way that God has always showed his tremendous mercy and his tremendous long suffering and patience and kindness toward mankind. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16, God was going to bring condemnation on the wicked cities of the Canaanites. But he says the, the, the wickedness or the, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. He says, I'm waiting on those people to repent. As wicked and as terrible as they were, God says, I'm waiting on them to repent. In Ezekiel 33, 11, he says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't want any wicked person to die. If we can think of the most vile and unrighteous person or group of people, God wants those people to be saved. He doesn't take any pleasure in watching anybody uh, live a wicked and unrighteous life and headed to a condemnation. God does not smile in heaven and say, oh, you're going to get what's coming to you. He wants us all to be saved. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, where he says, And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. God is, is patient with every one of us. Isn't it good to know that God has allowed you space to repent? Isn't it good to know that at this moment, your life may not be in order, but God is allowing you this moment space to repent, that you can get your life together. He's saying, even with this wicked person who was in the midst of my church, Doing unrighteousness, I allow that person doing that sort of thing, space and time to repent. Oh, my friends, God is long suffering. Rightly, Peter wrote that God is long suffering, and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he waited for this person to repent of her fornication. What'd she do with that time? What'd she do with her time? The Bible says, and she repented. to read those words of a calloused and a hard heart. But did you know that that happens just about every single time we come together? 
God offers every one of us space to repent of whatever it is that we may have done throughout the week. And we come together. If there's a lost person that needs to repent of his sins and answer the gospel, if there's a person who's a child of God who has sinned every single time we come together, God is giving us space to repent. But do you know how many people leave buildings just like this, walking out of pews just like these, and they walk out that door having not repented? Having said, no, thank you. I know you're gracious and kind and merciful and you're patient. Oh, I know you want me to be saved so much to send Jesus and die for my sins, but no thank you. How terrible the cost it is to pay for your sins when Jesus has offered his blood to pay the penalty for you, for me. This, this person, God says, to Jesus rather says, I'm, I'm waiting. I offered you time. And you say it? No. This person chose not to repent. And because they didn't use that time, because they didn't care to answer the call of God's tremendous mercy, he says, well, fine then. If you will not accept my mercy, you will take my justice. What then does he say to this church? Verse 22, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. He says, okay, you want to find yourself in a bed of pleasure? I will turn that bed of pleasure into a bed of pain. You want to live a life of seduction? You will now have suffering. You want to sin? He says, there are consequences. <laughs> I will cast her. When he says, I will cast her into this bed, this is not saying that he will allow her to walk gently in. Oh, this is not to take her and lay her. He says, you want to live in that life of sin? I will now cast you into this bed, and with you will be them that commit adultery with her. So all those that have been seduced by her, all those that partake with her, they too will be thrown into this bed of great tribulation. But even then, there's a glimmer of hope. He says there is going to be tribulation, except they repent. Even with the pronouncement of justice, Jesus is saying, I'm trying to be merciful. I can't tell you how many times I've heard similar words from my parents. My mother would say, Stephen, I'm trying not to get you. And we would just keep pushing the envelope, running around the house and throwing balls in the house. And she said, I'm trying to be patient with you until we push the envelope just far enough and then justice rang. <coughs> and so Jesus is saying, I'm trying to be patient. You're choosing not to repent. And so here is my pronouncement of what is going to happen, except you repent. But notice now what's going to happen. Not only is Jezebel, or the, the her, verse 22, going to get it, but he says, also them. Why would it be her and them? Look at the last words in that verse, verse 22. It said they repent of what? Of their deeds. They are all participating together. Yes, one is the ringleader of it. Yes, others are the followers of it. But it matters not if you are doing anything that's contrary to the word of God, whether you start it or you finish it, there's going to be tribulation and punishment for you. He says these people... They're going to get it, her and them, for all of their deeds. Not only so, verse 23, I, I, I'll read this in a, in a different way for maybe sensitive ears that may be here. It says, and I will kill her followers. Yeah. Those that have been born, if you will, of her teaching. Those that are her devoted followers or her disciples. He says, oh, I'm going to kill them with the devil. Remember what the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is what? Oh, momentary sickness. No, the wages of sin is what? Oh, a bad day. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. So Jesus says to them, if you want to live in that sin, that's fine. But know that there's going to be a penalty. And he's going to be the one that doles it out. I will kill the followers with the death. And listen to what he says next. He says it's going to be this bed of tribulation. He says that her followers will be killed with the death. 
and all the churches shall know. All the churches shall know. He said, I'm going to do something to this person and all of her followers so that everyone that sees it will absolutely know something. What do you want them to know? That I am he which searches the reins and hearts. I'm the one. I see everything that's going on. Searches the reins and the hearts. He is the one that sees everything in us. As we read in Hebrews 4.13, all things are naked and open in the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He says, I'm the one that sees it all. And I'm going to make an example about these people. He says, and I will give unto uh, every one of you according to your works. Jesus says, I want every one of you to take notice, not only in this church in Thyatira, but I want everyone in all the churches to see something. Sin is serious. Consequences are great. So I want everybody to take notice of this. And every one of you will receive that which you have done according to your works. To every individual, says that which you have done. Now, so many in the religious world will tell us that what you do doesn't matter. It's only what matters in your heart, in your mind. It's just what you believe. My friends, listen to what Jesus says. Upon what will the basis of your condemnation come? This, this text here says, according <coughs> to your works. We'll all stand before the judgment seat of God to receive that which we've done in our bodies, whether good or bad. So we'll be blessed or condemned according to that which we have done in Galatians 6, 7 and 8. It says to us that God is not mocked. We shall receive that which we have done. If we sow the flesh, we shall have the flesh reap corruption. If we sow the spirit, we shall have the spirit reap eternal life. Romans chapter 11, verse 22. Notice he says, notice the, the, or behold rather, the goodness and the severity of God. Yes, God is long suffering. Yes, he is merciful. Yes, he is kind. But he is also just and vengeful. And he will rain down terror on every person that refuses to accept his grace. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 reminds us when Jesus returns. First, at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we read about his return for those that are righteous and faithful. And oh, what a glorious day that will be. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we have another vision of his return and how that will be. He will come back for vengeance and flaming fire, taking vengeance rather than those that know not the gospel, know not God, and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we think about that, the Lord is going to come back and bring vengeance on those that do not know or obey him. One might say, well, well, what about, what about that fellow over there who, you know, maybe he just didn't know any better? Flame and fire and those who know not God and obey not the gospel. My friends, if you have not obeyed the gospel, there will be no glorious looking for and anticipation of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have not obeyed the gospel, you are not a New Testament Christian in the way that the Bible describes, you will only know the severity of the Lord Jesus Christ. You might ask, well, why? Do I have to be a member of that particular church? No. My friends, every person who has sinned, the way of sin is death, so every person will stand before the Lord with his sins, unless his sins have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now that washing also adds <coughs> into the church. But my friends, you must obey the gospel. These people were going to be dealt with according to their work. St. Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Reminds us, knowing therefore, listen, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade him. Jezebel was seducing. Christians try to persuade. We try to preach the truth. And we tell people of the glory and the riches and the peace of heaven. We also want to warn the terror and darkness and loneliness, complete utter separation from God, it is to be in him. Jesus says these people will be uh, given exactly what they deserve according to their works. Verse 24, but I say, or rather, but unto you I say, and to the rest of thy time, as many as have not this doctrine. He says, okay, now, here's what's going to happen to these wicked people. But I'm saying this now to you, the church, and also to the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine. Whoever it is is not following along with the teachings of seduction from this Jezebel, and, have, uh, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. I'm not going to put anything on you. Now notice he says, which have not known the depths 
I know Satan, that phrasing is, is kind of irregular. We don't necessarily use that. It is most commonly uh, thought uh, that this may mean that this group of people here would say, well, you've never done these things, so you can't judge me. Unless you participate with me, you don't know, so you can't judge. They have not known the depth. They have not sunk those same depths of Satan. Whether it be that or whether it is the case that he's just referring to whatever they were doing as the depths of Satan, whatever it is, he said, if you've not done those things to you, I will add no more burden. It's good to know that the Lord recognizes exactly who was doing what. Never think that what you're doing is being overlooked, whether good or bad. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. Hold fast till I come. Hold on to it, never let it go. What should they hold on to? Remember in verse 19, their works, their charity, their service, their faith, their patience, once again their works. He says you hold on to that. Don't let those good things go. Remember in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, Paul says, hold fast to that which is good. Hold on to the good things. Hold on to the godly things. Yes, cast away that which is bad and evil and unrighteous, but that which is good, hold on to it. Don't let it slip from your grasp. Again, he reminds them, and he that overcometh. That pronoun, he, is an individual pronoun. He that overcometh. We can't stand before God and say, yep, the highway church of Christ, we're overcoming. We won't stand before the Lord as a group. We won't stand before the Lord and have our parents before us and say, well, I can I can get in behind them. If I get down real low, maybe I can sneak in with them. It's not going to be a party rate. Each one of us will stand before the Lord all by ourselves. He says, he that overcometh, the individual, whether it be male or female, boy or girl, he that overcometh, the individual that continues to overcome, who sees the sin out there and stays the course of righteousness, who may be persecuted, but stays the course of, course of righteousness, who may be tempted and seduced, but stays the course of righteousness to that person, he says, he which overcometh and keeps my works unto the end. Keeps my words? No, my friend. Keeps my works unto the end. Continues to do that which Jesus said to do. What are the things that Jesus has commanded us to do? To go forth and preach the gospel to every creature. What are those things that Jesus commanded us to do? To love our neighbor. What are some of those things that Jesus commanded us to do? To love our spouses. To love our children. What are some of those things that Jesus commanded us to do? He says, you keep doing those things. Whichever one who overcomes and keepeth my works unto the end. What of that person, Lord? The person who continues to overcome and keep your works to the end, he says to him, will I give power over the nations. Jesus is not stingy with authority. He says, I'm going to share that with you. I will give you power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of the potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father, Jesus says, I will give you the same authority with me. You will share in my glory with me when you overcome the world. Who doesn't want to take part of that? Who here would say, you know what, Jesus, you're offering a crown of righteousness. You're offering eternal life. You're offering authority. You're offering peace. Doesn't sound like anything I want. Who would say something like that? Jesus says, "Is one that overcomes, I will allow him to share that with me. And in verse 28, the most beautiful, if you will, at least in my estimation, he says, and I will give him the morning star. What are you going to give, Jesus? What is the morning star? Or better stated, who is the morning star? Revelation 22 and verse 16, Jesus states to himself, I am the bright and morning star. Jesus says to those overcoming, you will have me. Can you imagine that? Jesus says to me, when we read the book of Revelation about the new heavens and the new earth, yes, there will be no sadness and tears and crying and dying and all those things, but the greatest part of heaven is not going to be the stuff that's around it, my friends. It's going to be the presence of Jesus. When Paul went to bring comfort to Christians in Thessalonica, he says, and so shall you ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What words? That you can always be with Jesus. To these Christians here, he says, I will give you myself. 
Then he reminds him, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. I'm sure that there is no person in this building who is unable to hear what I'm saying. I'm sure your ears can detect the sound that's coming from my voice and the, and the speakers here. But there's a far different thing from hearing what the Word of God says to us and listening to what the Word of God says to us. When Jesus says, he that hath ear, that doesn't just mean, can your ears pick it up? Well, hey, okay. He's saying, if you have ears, hear, listen. Take it in. Allow it to permeate your heart and your mind and do something with it. If you're hearing these words that Jesus said, these words of warning or commendation, we should, in effect, try to make application where we can so that this church isn't like Thessalonica or isn't like Pergamos and those negative attributes. We should be doing our very best to, to model their commendations. So he says, to he that have here, let him The Spirit says to the church, Are your ears open today? Are we listening to what the Lord says to us today? Are we maybe part of the group that's either Jezebel or suffering Jezebel? Or are we part of that group that's working and serving and loving? Have ear, let me hear. The greatest thing that a person can hear and give ear to is not just how to behave oneself in the church, though that is vitally important. The greatest and most important thing that you will ever hear is how to get into the church. If you're not a Christian, you need to know that you need to be in the church. Why do you need to be in the church? You know, some people, some salesmen will say, oh, you need this product. No, I really can live without it. But you cannot live eternally without the church. Oh, you need the church. So what should you do to get into that church? Because in that body, Jesus promised in Ephesians chapter 5 that he's going to save that body. He said in Ephesians chapter 4, there was just one body. How then can I get into that body, which is Christ? Well, Romans chapter 6, Galatians chapter 3 indicate that we can only be baptized into Christ. When, does it, when then is a person to be baptized? We just grab a guy off the street and say, hey, you look like a good candidate. Come jump in the water. No, a person has to hear message says. Hear that, that glorious good news that Jesus died for your sins and believe it with all your heart. Be willing to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior and Christ. Be willing to repent or turn away from sin and then go down to the waters of baptism. The water is ready. It always is. Heaven is poised and waiting for your answer. And then you live faithfully until the Lord returns. And we can gladly anticipate his return. If you're not a Christian or you're not living like the Bible tells you you want to live, my friends, won't you fix it today? What could you possibly be waiting for? What day could possibly be better than right now to get your life together? We're all anticipating tomorrow going back to work. Maybe we've been off the kiddos, back to school. But what if tomorrow never came? What if in the middle of the night we're all resting? What if the Lord said, this is the time I'm going to send my son. The clouds open. We hear the trump of God. What would we say? Oh, I wish I had. Mm, it won't be time to do that. The Bible says we'll all be changed. How fast? <coughs> Twinkling of an eye. We'll all be changed. It'll be too late. I don't want to scare a person to repentance or to baptism, but I want to persuade, as Paul says, person to know what you ought to do. And so if you want to answer the call of the gospel today, won't you come on forward as together we stand and sing our call?